Welcome to Live with Arpedio. I'm your host, Angus Robertson. I'm a partner and fractional chief marketing officer at Chief Outsiders. Today, our topic is how to leverage AI or artificial intelligence for sales success. And we have a very special guest, Jim Dickey. Jim was at Miller Hyman as a managing partner for more than 20 years. He's also an author with Harvard Business Review on the topic of AI and sales. Jim, welcome. Thank you, Angus. I'm happy to be here today. Great to have you. Can we start off by um, you providing a little bit of background on yourself and what you're doing now? Sure. Um, I think it, um, by way of uh, by background, some people may know us from uh, CSO Insights. You know, We started doing primary research on what are the challenges facing sales teams 29 years ago. So we've got 29 years worth of data on what happens when the economy is good, when it's bad, when it's neutral, et cetera. And what we always take a look at is what are the challenges facing sales teams today? What's causing those problems? But more importantly, what do you do about it? How do you leverage people, process, technology, and knowledge? So we're a pure research company. We don't do any consulting. We don't do implementation of CRM. We don't do sales training. So if we come and give somebody advice on you need to do this, it's because that's what the data is suggesting. Um, my background is also in technology. I co-founded three software companies. I did my first AI projects back in the 80s using algorithms from the 50s. So they were both abject failure projects back then. But you know, I've been around. I've also been the uh, uh, contributing editor for Sierra Magazine since it started 26 years ago. So I'm a technology skeptic, I'm a sales realist and practitioner. And so what I wanted to do today was just share with you some of the latest data we've got on what's going on in the world of sales, specifically as related to AI, because I think it's finally at the point where it's gonna be a fundamental game changer in how companies work with their, how buyers and sellers engage each other going forward. And that could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you do it. Well, Jim, that's that's great. And I'm really excited to dive into some of your research. I know you have uh, some slides and, and some new research that, that you've done in the area of artificial intelligence and sales. And of course, references some of the, the work and insights uh, and best practices uh, you presented in your um, latest Harvard Business Review article on uh, success matrix for, for sales. And uh, I think some of the insights you're going to share in your research are particularly interesting around uh, the relationship opportunity for sales and just how, how AI really is a, a game changer for, for sales. And, and for our audience, um, as Jim goes through his research and shares some of his insights and, and uh, examples, please feel free to ask questions in the comments. So we'll be looking uh, for your questions as Jim uh, presents his research. I uh, definitely encourage anyone to ask questions because, you know, we there's no standard way the company sells. So we all have our own unique problems, our own unique perspectives. So happy to answer any questions. I guess if you want to pass them along as we go on, I'm definitely interrupt driven. Uh, but today for the audience, uh, what I want to do is I'm going to be sh sharing with you some data that we're going to be publishing at the end of this week. It's our 2023 sales performance scorecard study. Uh, it's 50 pages. If you're interested in the report, you can email me at Jim and Sales Mastery. Happy to send you the entire report. But what I did for today's session was I pulled out some things specifically as related to AI. Because six years ago, as part of this study, we started looking at AI as an emerging trend in sales enablement. And we didn't know what role it was going to play, how it was going to play. Uh, that when we made our first list of companies that qualified as having an AI for sales component, there were 26 firms on the list. Uh, today, there are over 400. So it's definitely something that is exploding out there, but it's also something that can be misunderstood or misconstrued. And so I just wanted to share with you some of the latest data, because what we've been doing is, as part of our study is we deal really look at three cohorts. Uh, so we look at companies who have already implemented AI for sales, which five years ago was very few and far between. We take a look at those who are evaluating or planning on evaluating really soon AI for sales. And then we still take a look at the people 
who have no interest in AI, which by the way, is still the vast majority of the marketplace. So when I present these numbers here, these are not market share numbers. <laughs> these are, you know, I biased the data. I did it on purpose because I wanted three cohorts, those who have done it, those who are interested, those who aren't interested. And so I just want to make that real clear up front on what we're trying to accomplish here. But what we're finding right now is there are more people that are interested in AI for sales than ever before, it mainly becomes sales has become much more challenging. Uh, as you'll see when we read the, this year's study, when we went and asked what percentage of your sales team met their quota for 2022, it was down to 53%. When we then said, what percentage of your overall plan did you achieve? You know, it was around 86%. Those are both you know, low numbers based on the 29 years we've been doing that study. So, you know, people are dealing with challenging times right now and they're looking for, are there answers? And so that's what I want to focus on, on AI as being a potential thing for you to at least investigate, if not implement. And so one of the things we did, I'm going to focus on the people that have implemented AI for sales. We talked to them about it and we said, you know, what did you implement? You know, there are a lot of things out there. And what you're starting to find is that things that are popping up are things that have become commonplace over the last four or five years. So there have been a lot of these, you know, uh, marketing companies and prospecting companies that have come up and said, hey, you can use AI to do prospect engagement. We could customize a message out to your prospect and you know increase the chances that they'll open up your email or we'll give you specific messaging to use on your website they'll attract more people but it's going to be unique it's not going to be one size fits all you know you've seen a lot of things around gong and chorus that we're doing sales call activity people ai trafficking you know what kind of appointments are happening those are becoming more commonplace for people who are implementing ai for sales you're seeing things that will customize the content so that when you go and say, you know, here's a data sheet and you send it out to your five people who are on the, the team that are evaluating your product, there may be a different data sheet for the economic buyer than the, than the technology buyer, than the financial buyer. It'll all be different based on their specific agendas. Doing things like lead scoring, coaching. So these are becoming much more pervasive out there. But again, realize there is no AI for sales suite today. These are all point solutions. Eventually you will start to see things coalesce in the marketplace as they always do. I was at a Dreamforce a couple of weeks ago and you know there were a number of announcements there where Salesforce is taking AI capabilities, embedding them into their core CRM system. But again, they're just pieces of the solution. But what we're seeing is AI is now being designed to touch every single aspect of customer lifecycle management and do so in a way that's unique and allow us to do things we've never, ever done before. And Jim, when you look at these sets, I think there's uh, nine sets of functionality here and what's listed at the top, either um, over 40% implemented or, or close to 40% implemented. What do you expect, or if you if you look in your crystal ball uh, a year from now or, or two years from now, do you see these rankings changing, or do you see other functional functionality sets um, coming coming out out of the woodwork that that we don't see on this list? Yeah, great question, Angus. And I think the major thing is things like you know people I mean, five years ago is big magic. So you have a Zoom session with a client. <clears throat> and you record the session and AI will transcribe it and it will tell you who is doing more talking or not. And that was big magic five years ago. Today, that's table stakes. So those things will go up to be 70, 80, 90% impl you know, implemented because they'll be part of your core CRM system. What will be interesting is the things that come on and replace it because those are gonna deal with much harder problems and things that we couldn't solve five years ago because the data wasn't there or you know we didn't know what to do with it, those problems are gonna be solved. So I'm much more interested in what's not on this list yet. And we can get into some of those when we do our, our Q and A. You know, we've been doing case studies on where some of the real advanced uses of AI that are really the game changers. These are all nice 
because they can help impact the performance of a salesperson, but there's going to be some things that redefine the relationship between sales buyers and sellers. Got it. So we then asked me, okay, you're implementing these things, but so what? <laughs> what are the benefits? And one of the things, again, this is the one of the keys for having data for 29 years is we started asking 29 years ago when Salesforce Automation first came out, what are the top three benefits you're getting from your, your SFA, then CRM investments? And it was interesting because top of the list most years were three things. It reduced the admin burden on my salesperson. It uh, improved the communications between a salesperson and their manager and it streamlined the forecast process. Notice I did not say it improved the forecast process, it streamlined it. Today, when we did our, our survey this year, we asked what's the outcome of forecast deals, it came in that the average win rate was 47%. Again, this is forecast deals. And the win rate's 47%. And then if you and I jumped on a plane, went to Vegas, went to the craps tables and made a pass bet, the odds of winning are 49.3%. So what we've been doing with CRM and Salesforce automation has been really things about streamlining things and increasing efficiency. But that just means my average salesperson is in a position to make more average sales calls. And that's not the challenge today. I need my average person to make great sales calls. So you see here that AI is still helping to increase selling time, but then you see something like, oh my God, it's helping to increase revenues per rep. <laughs> it's starting to increase the win rate of forecast deals. You know, it's not only improving the activity of my salesperson, it's making my coach, my boss, a better coach. So these are all effectiveness things. And I think that's really where AI becomes a game changer. It increases efficiency and effectiveness. And I think... That's what we've really got to understand is, you know, what's the potential and the power and how do we go about harnessing that in a more meaningful way? And Jim, um, you mentioned uh, an example um, that helps illustrate some of these benefits uh, in the area of, of white space analysis and, and a financial services organization being able to understand where the white space is, but then execute on, on that opportunity. Uh, can you Share, share some information on that example or that story? Sure, um, we, we did a case study a couple of years ago on uh, uh, US Bank, we published this before. And what they did was a lot of people have been using AI to do prospect scoring. US Bank was interesting because what they said was we're gonna use AI to do existing customer scoring. So they used AI for what it does best. They said, here's 4.2 million records of our existing customers that we value. And so we'd like you to go take a look and say, are there other things that these customers would want from us besides what they're already getting from us? So we could enhance the relationship. So what they did was they ran an algorithm against the 4.2 million records, took two hours to complete, scored all the customers, gave them a score between one and 100, and they told their financial officers, call on everybody that has a score of 81 and above. And within weeks, they had a 234% increase in conversion rate of existing customers to net new opportunities. So it was telling them, here's the customer, here's their score, here's why we gave them the score, here's what you should go talk to them about. And when they started having those conversations, opened up a whole bunch of new ways of, of talking to the customer. So it gave them a valid business reason to reach out. And it wasn't just, hey, Angus, uh, tell me about what you think our relationship is. Hey, Angus, let me tell you about our relationship and what else we could do for you. Got Interestingly it. enough, and this is, again, something I want to drive home in this thing several times, is we when I went back a year later and I said, I want to use this number, 234%, in my uh, presentation I'm doing, but you know, I've written it down in a notebook and I can't even, read, I can't even read my own handwriting. So I called their SVP of strategy back at the bank and I said, is, is the number right? And he says, well, it, it's right, it's, it's just old. And I went, oh my God, you know, go down? He said, no, 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 it went up. He said, what's the new number? He said, 386%. And I said, wow, what'd you do differently? He said, nothing. 
the algorithms got smarter. And I think that's the other thing to understand here. In a lot of the things we try to do in sales enablement, we try something, it works, it doesn't work, and then we have to figure out what to do next. AI's got a machine learning component. It will figure out what to do next as well. And so I was presenting those numbers to a bank that was in the same marketplace. And all of a sudden they came back and said, well, they were focused on the 2x improvement to begin with. They said, do you really think we'd get a 2x uplift? And I said, that's half the question you should be asking today. The other half is, how far behind your competition do you want to be? They're almost at 4x. Right. So you got to start thinking about this thing, too, of AI can not only change things for you, it can change things for your competitor. And so you know, you, it, there's a huge advantage here on first mover advantage that we've never seen before. And we've got to take that in consideration because there is a cost to being late to this party. So let me share with you, because I found this to be interesting. We asked the question, we said, of all the participants, so all three cohorts, those who have implemented, those who are evaluating, those who have no interest, we asked them the same question, which is, what do you, based on what you know, what do you think the impact of AI for sales is going to be on the sales profession in three years? And what we see here is that 41% came in back and said, it's a game changer. You know, you're going to be at a competitive disadvantage if you don't. Now, 30% said it's going to be an important addition. And then you got around 22% coming back and saying, eh, yeah, nice to have, can buy without it or unsure. Again, this is the, <coughs> excuse me, across all the participants. But when we broke it down by cohort, you see a different story. So here in the dark black, those are the responses for companies who have implemented it. And so for them, people who actually have firsthand experience, 91% say this is either a game changer or a very key addition to what we're using in order to help our salespeople sell. Conversely, the light gray is the people who have no interest. And as you see there, about 30% say, eh, get by without it or it'll be a nice to have. No, 21% have no clue. That's an issue. Because when we've done this before in the past on CRM, we have never seen 91% of, of organizations who have implemented CRM say, I can't live without it. And so all of a sudden now, there are people, the people that are implemented are sending a message back to the rest of the marketplace. And those who are not interested better listen saying, hey, this is something we haven't seen before. So I think this is something that, again, raises a little bit of a yellow flag for saying, if you're not looking, you can look and decide not to do anything, but you better at least look and educate yourself because the black guys here with the black, you know, experience of bars know something that you don't because they're actually doing it. Yeah, Jim, this this data is, is telling a, a story that should... Uh scare uh, some of the companies out there because as you highlighted earlier, some of the first movers with AI, some of those early adopters that have uh, dived into AI are seeing benefits and are even more convinced of uh, the value of, of AI. And then you have this other cohort that doesn't know what they don't know and uh, are not sure of the AI value. So the more this goes on, the further that group of company that group of companies falls falls behind. So this is certainly a wake up call because there are AI haves versus AI have nots in this in this chart for sure. Almost like that financial stock trader uh, stockbroker with the the first set of blackberries versus the ones with the with the flip phones. Absolutely, um, that's a it's a great a great chart. Um, so. Um, Jim, one of the things you, you you talked about earlier, which I thought was really interesting, um, the advent of, of CRM was obviously a significant game changer for many sales organizations. Or, uh, an effective sales organization can't operate with effectively or well with, without a CRM. How do you see AI impacting uh, sales organizations? Because uh, for many salespeople, CRMs are sort of a, a necessary evil. It's not something that they always are, are excited about using or keeping up to date. 
uh, is is AI the the same sort of scenario? And does AI um, start to impact sales sooner, or is it a, a long deployment or or implementation time as well? Yeah, a great question, Angus. And, and let me kind of set the stage for that because you mentioned the article that we published. Uh, in Harvard Business Review. We co-authored it with Ben Shapiro and Boris Groyberg at, at Harvard Business School. Uh, ben is Chair Emeritus of Marketing. Boris runs the CEO Education Program, where CEOs of companies come to Harvard to go through an educational program. And one of the things we published in the article was this matrix. And what we said was, uh, looking at the world today, what we see is there are five levels of process that you could use to engage your customers. Far left, there's ad hoc. Everybody does their own thing. You know, we want you to be the CEO of your own business as, as your salesperson to know there's an informal process. There's a sort of some guidelines on how you would like you to engage customers, but it's not reinforced and enforced. To formal process, there is a way of doing things, challenger, solution selling, complex selling, whatever. Or there's agile process, which was a formal process with CRM. But when we did this thing, uh, Ben Shapiro from Harvard pointed out, well, at AI, there's a fifth level of process. It's customized. It's where you're going through and understanding the unique needs of that customer in relationship to their marketplace, in relationship to the other competitors they may be considering, in relationship to the financial goals or business goals they're trying to accomplish, and you develop a customized strategy for this. Think strategic account management on steroids. And then they said, okay, if that's the case, that we also said before there were five levels of, of a relationship you could have with one of your customers. Number one is I'm a transactional vendor. I'm nothing special, but you can buy from me. To number two, I'm the preferred supplier. All things being equal, I'll get more than my fair share of orders as a vendor. Two, solution consultant. I'm beyond just a vendor. I'm helping you implement and utilize what I'm selling you. But now with AI, there became two different levels of relationship above that. One was the strategic collaborator. We're actually sharing data back and forth on how to implement this thing and how to tweak the use of these things you know, so that we can be more effectively working together to trust a co-creator. I mean, think about something like Boeing and GE who makes jet engines for Boeing. You know, what they're doing is they're actually now collaborating and co-creating not only what's going to happen with the 787, but what's going to happen with the 797. And so when we first published this, we said, you know, we need to go, here's a nice framework conceptually it makes sense to us that this would be the playing field going forward but we didn't have any data but again with this year's study now we do have data and let me share that because it'll get to your question and, and, at the and highest just... level what we found was this that there were about 31 percent of the companies that fit into the uh grids here in the matrix the segments here in the matrix and they all had about the same average performance. We found that in the yellow, there was another 37% of companies, you know, all again had about the same level of performance. And the, in the upper green is kind of the emerging things with these new levels of relationship at the collaborator and co-creator, and also, you know, starting to bring together a customized process. And so you go, okay, that's great, but it doesn't make a difference. And the answer is yes, because when you look over to the right here and you see there's level one, 45%, 76%, 45 represents the average percentage of salespeople who achieve quota for level one companies. 76% was the average overall plan attainment, revenue plan attainment for those companies. So pretty low, I don't know how many, senior management teams are going to be working for a level one company who are not buying a lot of Maylocks because they live in an unpredictable world. So, but then you take a look at level two, something interesting happens. The overall plan attainment goes up to 85%, percentage of reps making quota goes up to 48%. So think about what that's telling you. It says that when you get to level two, 
we're finding ways of increasing performance, but really the big bump comes from making your good people better, not making your out underperformers you know, regular performance. So it, there's a little tweak. I go from 45 to 48%, but I get a large boost in overall plan attainment. But if I get to level three, again, the emerging level, 61% of reps making quota 94% of plan attainment in an, un, in an unpredictable world right now. So those are the types of things that come back and say that, yeah, what we're seeing, get back to your question, Angus, is that, if you, oh, by the way, there are two gray areas, and I want to point those out. We found virtually no one who has a customized process who has not figured out at least a way to get to become a preferred supplier in their marketplace. So if you've got customized, your, your chances of being a, you know, just seen as yet another player are, are almost zero. Conversely, in the upper left-hand corner, if you're ad hoc, we haven't seen anybody that's gotten a way to get to be a trusted co-creator at the company level. Your, your, one of your customers may view the, the, the account manager they work with as a trusted co-creator on a one-to-one -one relationship, but it's not the relationship between that company and all their customers. It is a real unique type of thing. So I think this kind of, again, lays the framework out there that you know, this is something that is happening right now. It's going to create a new playing field for people to be playing on. And the sooner you get to green, the better, because you'll be able to stay in the green. If you're getting data from AI and getting your feedback and it's adapting the processes and it's improving the algorithms and you're expanding into other areas of customer lifecycle management and, 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 and. But as we go on into 2024, it's telling you something. If you're a level one company today, you better start figuring out a way to get to level two. And if you're a level two company, you better start figuring out a way to get to level three. Because otherwise, 2024 is going to be a really hard time for you. And so that's at the highest thing. You know, what we suggest doing is, again, going back to this model and saying, if you want to know where to start, where are you today? I mean, sit down with your team and say, where would I put us today in the matrix? Where would I like us to be? And what's standing in the way of us getting there? Because if you go through that process, you might identify 50 things you could do in order to start moving from lower left to upper right, but go through and pick two or three things to do. We think phased implementations are the right ways to handle this. And, and Jim, just, just on that, looking at this success metrics, uh, this is essentially a framework for sales leaders to assess their sales organizations as it relates to um, relationship and process level and where they're doing okay today and where they can improve. <laughs> and through that assessment exercise, identify, um, as you said, two or three areas to um, prioritize for investigating and implementing uh, potential a AI solutions. Is that the right way of looking at this success metrics? Uh, absolutely. I would just you know, think that there's a way of saying, let's just start the discussion. And let's start at a high level and then let's go lower and lower and lower and lower. But I don't want to turn this into a Six Sigmoidoscopy exercise. So we try to provide a framework that works, but the data clearly backs up that this is a valid framework to be using for you to at least start having those conversations. So, so Jim, I think one of the really interesting insights that you found out, out of this research is um, going back to the fundamentals of what makes a good salesperson and how technology is not necessarily getting, getting in the way as it relates to AI, but is helping sales who are truly capable um, differentiate themselves in, in the area of, of relationships and, and relationship management and, and relationship mapping. Um, can you speak a little bit more to that insight and, and how as AI and technology progresses that uh, it's important for, for sales to focus on the value of, of the relationship and how they develop that relationship? Sure, and, and you bring up a really good point that I, I want people to understand is um, the, 
if you look at the lower left hand corner and you think about the hiring profile you would have for that person versus the upper right hand corner, they're different people. And so we need to start figuring out, okay, are the people that got us here today going to people going to be the people that make us successful three years from now? And when I joined IBM a million years ago, they were looking for skills like persuasion, you know, drive, ability to handle rejection, et cetera. When I talk to people today, I talked to the uh, C CRO at a company called Databricks, and he was talking about, I want people who, you know, are collaborators or co-creators. One of my things I, I look for is people who are in search of the truth. I go, wow. That's, that's a slightly different person out there. But let me give you an example on this thing. So, And here's how this can all tie together. So worked with a company that was in the agri-loan business. And so, you know, based out of Omaha, Nebraska, mainly working with large farms, you know, calling on farmers. And so it's not a traditional thing. But again, you know, their, their old way of doing thing, relationship management, would be, hey, Angus, I got some tickets to the football game this weekend. Why don't we go and we'll talk about some farming? You go, let's do it. Um, what they found that we found a company out of LA that is aggregating agricultural data. So they get data from satellites that are going above fields, and it can tell you on a farm by farm basis, field by field basis, what the temperature and moisture content is of that field. They're also gathering data from drones. So the Department of Agriculture has drones that fly over fields and they can tell you on a stock by stock basis with corn, for example, what the pest infestation is within a field. <coughs> there are sensors on a John Deere tractor. So as it goes up and down the, the field, it can tell you what the density is. So it could give you feedback on what harvesting would be. So aggregating all of that information for the sales force, it gives me a different thing. So I don't call you up and say, Angus, tell me about your farm. I go, Angus, let me tell you about your farm. When we started talking about the season, you said you were going to switch from soybean to corn. You were going to look to uh, go ahead and plant in early April. So you wanted to start your line of credit in early March. You thought you might be able to harvest at the beginning of September. You thought the yields would be 97% of what they were last year. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but there was a late spring. And so you, you didn't get planted on time after the late spring was followed by a wet or a wet spring was followed by a dry summer. It's now going to be a little bit delayed on when you're going to be harvesting. By the way, the projections are 94% yields versus 97%. And the optimum time for you to harvest is going to probably be the end of September. And then you're going to need three to five weeks to sell, not one to two weeks to sell in order to get the best price. So based on all that, what we want to do is extend your line of credit through November versus having you try to pay us back at the first of October. And all we want is an extra 16th of a point. Wow. That's a different conversation. Yeah, that's me exactly. bringing insights to the table that you don't have as a farmer. I think that becomes the power of AI to empower the right type of salesperson who is ready to have those discussions and can bring to AI what AI doesn't have, which is judgment. You know, that's where the two come together. So yeah, at the lower level, AI can take over transactional sales. Absolutely can do that. B2B, B2C. But in more complex sales, it's going to be a different matter. Well, I know you have insights on this too, but uh, successful sales people in, in my experience are, are those that can help uh, their customers be successful. So as you highlighted here, if you've got a salesperson who understands uh, their customer's business and has insights into their customer's business, especially relative to the solution that their, their product or service that they're providing, uh, that's going to help develop the relationship and, and uh, give, give that customer a reason to answer, answer the phone. Um, so, uh, AI is moving fast and it's uh, a little alarming how disruptive AI can be. And you provided a, a framework for at least assessing where organizations, sales organizations can focus. Um, are there any risks to AI that 
um, you want to highlight or, or any suggestions that um, you can give sales leaders from a change management um, per perspective? Yeah, I think really the, the key thing is before you start going out and looking for AI, know what problem you're trying to solve. You know, am I dealing with a prospecting problem? And am I dealing with a needs analysis problem? And no, we do a great needs analysis. We're just coming up with a problem, kind of communicating a sense of urgency in today's uncertain environment. You know, I always joke about in uncertain environments, the CFO becomes a CF no. And so I wanted to just no. How about this? No. How about this? And so, you know, I, I'm having problems getting this, you know, past the CF no to do something now. They said, can we just wait until 2024, 2025 before we make that investment? So what problem are you trying to solve? Because if you go to the vendors and you sit there and say, do you have AI for sales? I go, sure. But they've got a little sliver of it. So you know what problem you're trying to solve and that will start doing some things, but also realize for decades, there have been problems inherent with AI that are still prevalent today. They're understood, but there's a the whole data quality and data availability problem. You know, AI needs data to work. And you say, well, I, I, you know, I don't have my own data. Well, that's why things like the agriculture business, there are people that are going to turn data as a service into something as important as software as a service. They'll go out and they aggregate the data for you in certain market segments. But you got to understand where the gaps are today. There's also model bias. You know, so I'm, I'm coming up with a model. I'm going to go score my prospects. I may have built bias into the things where I'm not recognizing here are the industries I've been selling to. And so my, my model is biased to go look for other you know, people like that in those industries versus saying, wait a minute, you're totally missing this entire market segment over here. You haven't tried it all to sell to financial services companies. They're great prospects for you. There's a skill gap. Um, I literally know of people who are graduating with PhDs out of you know, Cal Poly and Berkeley and Stanford as a data scientist who are getting seven figure offers between you know, salary, signing bonus, stock options, seven figures right out of college, no experience, a PhD, but no experience in business. And so you know, there's a skill gap. If you are trying to build these things yourself, you're competing with companies like Microsoft and Google and Amazon, and they're gonna outbid you every time. But you take a look at something like Salesforce, they'll hire people and they'll start building AI for sales solutions that you can use. So there's accuracy problems, there's explainability and transparency problems. I'm not saying they're not problems. You know, I've written a lot about this in terms of the issues, but the downside of, you know, I always talk about what's the cost of doing something. That's what we always focus on. Oh my God, I gotta spend money on training. I gotta spend money on technology. I gotta hire more coaches for my sales. Oh my God, that's expensive. Well, let's talk about the cost of doing nothing. Here's the cost of doing nothing right here in this chart. You're right. If you're level one or level two companies, you are writing invisible checks today that your CFO would die if she or he understood the size of those checks in terms of competitive losses, no decisions, lower margins, smaller deal size, more customer. You're writing huge invisible checks. And so I think you need to go and take a look at those and say, you know what? Yeah, there's some things we'd have to deal with in order to implement AI for sales. But, you know, it's it's worth it because we can pay it back right now. Just, just make the right compensating investments to overcome the challenges that are out there. Because this, again, is something that this is going to make or break companies going forward in the future. So, Jim, I really appreciate you taking the, the time to take us through your research and highlight uh, what companies are, are doing, how far they are along in their uh, AI journey as it relates to sales. And also for those who are the early adopters, um, how they continue to invest and continue to uh, increase the gap from from between themselves and the competitors, and of course the uh, success metrics that you highlighted in that and that framework for assessing your sales organization relative to to AI 
and then just understanding what that impact can be. It's not just about efficiency. It's about creating value, developing relationships, increasing win rates, as you said, and uh, increasing increasing revenue. So uh, as we as we wrap up, and um, you know, you've you've emphasized just uh, that opportunity that AI um, presents, and even though it's an uncertain economic environment and the CFO may be saying no, now is not the time to stand by on the sidelines and watch your competitors uh, rush by. Um, I think you have another another story you can share of uh, a little bit of what's happened in a B2C and how AI could actually impact what's happened in, in B2C for, for B2B as well. Thanks, Angus. Yeah. Um, so in my past, as I mentioned, you know, I, I work for, so I co-founded three software companies. And in one of them, one of my old engineers uh, ended up going on and becoming the chief product architect at eBay. And so all the data scientists reported up through Steve. And so when I was talking with him a while back and I was sharing with him what was going on, um, I said, you know, here's the new model that I'm seeing emerging for B2B sales. He said, well, that's, that's great. He says, you left something out of your equation. I said, what's that? And he said, Alibaba. You know, Alibaba? I'm thinking, Alibaba's Amazon for China. And I go, no, 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 you don't understand, Steve. I'm talking B2B sales. And he says, Jim, I'm talking B2B sales. And so he takes me over and he shows me Alibaba's B2B side and shows me that I can order a half million dollar piece of mining equipment. I can order 10 solar powered communication towers that are 40,000 apiece. And he says, Jim, you don't think that Alibaba and Amazon and even eBay are trying to figure out how to just print and franchise the B2B salesperson. They're going to go, no, no, no. You want something for your business? Don't call a salesperson. Come to Alibaba. We got AI. We'll help you do a comprehensive needs analysis. Based on that, we'll tell you the three vendors who should be on your short list. We'll give you then a detailed feature comparison of those three vendors. We'll tell you who's actually using it, what they think about it. We'll tell you how much people are actually paying for this stuff. And when you're ready to place the order, we'll place it for you. So what's wrong with that? You know, buyer's going to ask, you know, well, here's the whole thing. If you're not bringing something else to the table, plan on happening in the B2B space. What happened to the B2C space? Where it's, what's the first thing? I'm, I'm going to go to Amazon. You know, so I think that's a warning out there. And already, by the way, if people saw it uh, a couple months ago, Walmart came out and said, we are doing B2B buying with AI. Not for what they sell in the stores, but actually building new stores. So they said, we need this many storage racks. We need this much lighting. We need this large of an HVAC system. And the AI is going out and negotiating those deals without you ever talking to a human being. So if you're a seller, realize AI is coming at you from a couple different angles and you better be one of the people using it because otherwise it's going to be used on you. Well, with, with that, Jim, I think that's a, a great way to end the, end the conversation. And for those who are interested in the survey or participating in the survey, it's, it's still open. Jim's still um, looking to get a few more uh, data inputs uh, in into the survey set. So look for the survey in the in the comments. And if you do fill it out, um, Jim, I believe they do get a a free copy of that survey. So yeah, the full report the full report. And if you're interested in in following up with Jim, uh, please please do so. But uh, Jim, thank thank you again for sharing your insights on uh, how sales can leverage AI for for greater success. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks for inviting me.